you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we, we come before you this morning praying for your word to be spoken and heard. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would place upon my lips what you desire to be revealed and that you'd open all of our hearts to the power and truth contained in your teaching, that through this we would be transformed into the disciples that you desire us to be. We pray this in the holy and precious name of Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. This is like the fourth week we've talked about idolatry, and I feel like I'm running out of information to give you. But this comes at it from one more different standpoint. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to walk through that Exodus um, narrative that was read and look at the dynamics that are going on, the relationship between Aaron and the people, between God and Moses, and the, the whole aspect of idols trying to crowd into their worship life. Then I also want us to reflect upon, does this have any bearing upon us in the church today? And, and to do that, we'll be focusing on a letter that Paul wrote to a young church leader by the name of Timothy, the second letter that he wrote. And we'll be looking at some of those dynamics. So the first thing that I think um, we need to pay attention to is that sometimes, <clears throat> I know this has never happened in this church, um, sometimes the people will put pressure on a religious leader to do things that aren't necessarily having anything to do with God. But people believe are so important, so critical, that if they don't do them, that somehow re the religious life is imperiled. Luther had a word for that. It's called adiaphora. Things that are really unimportant, things that aren't forbidden in Scripture, but they're not prescribed in Scripture. And, and to tell you the truth, folks, as a pastor, I've been around long enough, people get more energized, gnarly, um, passionate about adiaphora than they do the actual faith in God. And that's disturbing. That's what happens to Aaron in this situation. The people crowd up around Aaron, right? Um, they're, they're packing around him, and, and they say this to him. They say, I love this translation, come on! Come on, Aaron, right? Come on, make us some gods who will actually lead us. Now think about this. They are they're denigrating the God who heard their plea when they were slaves in Egypt, uh, set them free by bringing ten plagues upon Egypt, the last plague, the death of the firstborn, saved the people, then had them cross out through the Red Sea, uh, through this massive, miraculous thing, uh, saved them from Pharaoh's army that was chasing after them in the wilderness, provided them quail, provided them manna, provided them water, led them by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day, and the people say, we want somebody that's going to lead us. Hello? I mean, there's spiritual blindness all over the place with these people. And they scream out and say, we don't really like what's going on. We want this to operate in a different way. Paul writes to Timothy, <clears throat> and he says this, preach the word of God. That's it. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, Timothy, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Preach the word whether it's a good time or not a good time. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They'll follow their own desires. They'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myth. It pains me when I see leaders that don't preach the Word of God, <clears throat> standing in a pulpit and delivering a message that, that really has nothing to do with God, and that people come in droves to hear them because it's what the people want to hear. And usually what we want to hear is how great we are, how we can do it, how we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and, and we can accomplish great things. People come in droves.
to hear those messages. But that is not necessarily the gospel truth. It's a myth, something they want to hear. The people crowded around Aaron because they wanted a different kind of God. They wanted one that they could mold and create in whatever shape they wanted. So it's one thing for a religious leader to get pressure. What really causes me great angst is when a religious leader caves in and gives in to these desires. So look what Aaron does, right? Aaron says, okay, get all the gold you can and bring it to me, and it says he melted the gold, he melted that gold and molded it into the shape of a calf. Aaron did, the leader, the religious leader, the one that's supposed to set an example and give good teaching, he's the one who says, okay, you, this, is, this is what the people want, okay, this is what we're going to do. Paul warns Timothy and says, yeah, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You proclaim the gospel, it's going to come back at you. You proclaim the gospel, it's not necessarily going to go well for you. People are not going to want to hear that message because in that message, you hear that we are a bunch of sinners who need to die and be raised up. I mean, that's a great evangelism message, right? Hey, come to our church and die with us. Come and join our church because we're a whole bunch of sinners here, right? Boy, people really love that. No, what, what do they gravitate to? <laughs> they gravitate to what they want to hear. But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. Look what happened to Aaron. Not only did, did he allow the people uh, to do what they wanted to do, but he began to believe that what he was doing was okay. You must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know they're true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. How can you know you can trust them? Because they love you. They want what is best for you. They want you to become strong. They want you to grow in truth. We need to embrace those truths. Part of the problem with idolatry is that sometimes we consider that idolatry is innocent. It's not going to have any impact. It's no big deal. Don't really have to worry about it, right? <clears throat> the people um, end up getting confused. Or, I mean, they're already confused, but this adds to their confusion because they exclaim, after this, this calf has been molded, what do they exclaim? They say, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Not the Lord, not Yahweh, but these molden things, they're the ones that brought you out of Egypt. And then Aaron adds to the confusion, right? He sees that the people are all excited about this, all, all um, worked up about this, and he says, hey, this is really cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build an altar in front of this golden calf, and then tomorrow we can have a festival too the Lord, to Yahweh, an altar underneath this golden calf. Aaron is saying, we can blend these things together. There should be no confusion, no problem. People will sustain this without any doubt. Now, I'm almost terrified to raise this next issue. Do we confuse our religious festivals ever in the church? Okay, here we go. Christmas. <laughs> is there a confusion going on at Christmas? I mean, Christmas is the truth about the coming of the Son of God, taking dwell, flesh and dwelling among us, coming to redeem us and save us from our sin. That's the message of Christmas. And yet, what do we do? <clears throat> we got all kinds of other stuff at Christmas that becomes really important. I'm not going to name any of that stuff because I don't want hate emails coming to me from parents this week, right? But we have a lot of confusion at Christmas time. And for some people, for some people, Jesus disappears and all that other stuff becomes all there is to Christmas. Confusion, innocent idolatry leading to confusion. Now, 
I'm not going to get rid of Christmas trees. Don't, don't think I'm going to do that. But we need to focus on the truth, what is true and what is real. Paul writes to Timothy. He says this, in the last days, <clears throat> it's going to be really difficult times. It's going to be tough, Timothy. People will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud. They will scoff at God. They will be disobedient to their parents. They will be ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving. They'll be unforgiving. They will slander others. They will have absolutely no self-control. They will be cruel. They will hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride. They'll love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious. They will act religious. They will act religious but they will reject the power that could make them godly. They'll go through all the rules, they'll do all the right rituals, they will do all the right stuff, but in their heart, they're far from God. A few weeks ago, we talked about how it's not the commandments that make us holy, but it's the presence of God in our lives, our relationship with our God. Now, a lot of times the, the idols in our lives are things that are familiar to us, things that mean something to us, like a fish or a statue of a Red Sox baseball player or a basketball, things that we resonate with, right? I don't think that when Aaron crafted this cow out of gold that he was just doing some kind of art project where it came out of his creative juices. I believe he was... Um, tying the people back to something they knew. One of the Egyptian gods in the pantheon of, of ancient Egyptian gods was a, a, a god by the name of Hapsus, <clears throat> who was the son of one of the, the primary uh, uh, Egyptian deities by the name of Hathor. And, and this Hapsus was depicted as a bull, as a cow. And um, was in the process of their worship always seen as one who was sacrificed and come back, sacrificed and would come back, sacrificed and would come back. So the people resonated. They, they understood this. They, they had seen this God in operation. They knew this was a God that was worshipped as a part uh, of Egyptian life. And yet here it is, this Egyptian God, that then they say, this is the one who brought us out of Egypt. Doesn't make any sense. This this thing that they crafted became their object of worship. And we look at them and we go, man, what a bunch of crazy people. Who would buy into something like that? I mean, who would, who would possibly go there uh, to worship a golden calf like that? I've mentioned this book for several weeks now uh, by Timothy Keller <clears throat> called uh, Counterfeit Gods. If you haven't bought it and read it already, shame on you. No, I'm joking. I don't want to shame anybody. But in it, Timothy Keller talks about our situation in life and says that, that we can look back and pass judgment on these people back in, in uh, Mount Sinai and say, oh man, I can't believe that they would engage in that idolatrous worship, and yet we in our culture have all kinds of counterfeit gods that try to hold sway in our religious life, in, in our worship. And he says the empty, the subtitle is The Empty Promises of Money, Sex, and Power, and the Only Hope That Matters. Excellent book. It will confront you. It will not allow you to be comfortable with the way you are. Hmm. Because religious actions are not always a devotion to God. Okay? The people were told... They get up early the next morning. That's a sign of devotion, right? Getting up real early, right? They come out early in the morning and they, they have uh, uh, sacrifices, they have burnt offerings, they have peace offerings, but they are not offered to God. They're offered to hapsis. They are offered to this, this idol. And we're told that they engage in pagan revelry. Hmm? They're out of control. The Lord tells Moses, quick, go down the mountain, this cracks me up, your people 
who you brought out from the land of Egypt, right? I mean, listen to what God's doing. <laughs> Ain't my people. These are your people. It's like mom, you know, and, and dad. Your son, you know, not my son, but your son, you need to, you need to deal with your daughter, right? right? That's kind of what God's doing. I'm done. I'm done with these people. They have corrupted themselves, and they have turned away from the way that I have commanded them to live. We just spent two weeks talking about the commandments, the relationship with God, the relationship with neighbor, and God says they've already corrupted this. They've already walked away from this. They're not having anything to do with this. They're, they're trying to walk in a new path, a different way. Another book that you might want to look at this week is You Don't Get Your Own Personal Jesus. We're talking about having a personal relationship with Jesus. That's different than having your own personal Jesus. In other words, what he's talking about is is molding God in the image of what you want God to be. I had a a Bible study in my first congregation. It was on the Gospel of Mark, and I had a lady that came for about three, four weeks, and then she quit coming, and and so I asked her, you know, did did you get a a scheduling conflict? She said, no. Um, You know, in that study, uh, I started hearing a Jesus that wasn't my Jesus, and, and I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, I, I've got this, you know, idea of what Jesus should be like. And, and the Jesus described in the Gospel of Mark, that's not my Jesus. And I'm like, holy buckets, you know. You, you've crafted your Jesus in what you want him to be, but the Word of God <laughs> confronts you. Maybe you should pay attention to the Word of God. This is what he writes. Um, uh, Greer Air. One way we can tell if we've remade God in our image by, is by how often our God contradicts and offends us. If our God only affirms what we already think, then we're probably not listening to him, and instead we are deifying our own convictions. After all, any independent person has their own ideas and opinions which unavoidably conflict with ours. How much more should we expect this from God? If, in other words, you just hear God saying, you know, you're a really good person. Bill, you got it together. Um, it's all these other people that are all messed up, right? Uh, but you, I, I'm, re- I'm so glad I'm your God because you're such a treasure to me, right? If you hear God saying that to you, you probably aren't listening to God but to another voice because the fact is all of us are sinners. All of us are broken. All of us need conviction and comforting by our God. All of us need to be confronted by our God. All of us need to hear the grace that comes through Jesus Christ for us. It is not about us. And what we do, it is about what our God has done for us. These religious people are standing against God. To the point, I mean, this should just chill you, to the point that God finally says, I'm done. I'm done with these people. It's over, right? I'm going to destroy them. Now, God has a lot longer fuse than I do because if I was God, I would destroy them back in the wilderness with that whole manna and quail thing. That, that would have just pushed me over the edge. But God gets all the way to Mount Sinai and says, okay, I'm done. Now, what happens next is very interesting because Moses calms God down <laughs> and says, remember, these are your people. You made these promises to them, da 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 And God says, okay. Now, I thought, should I talk about this? But it'd be another two and a half hours I would have to add to my sermon. So that's another sermon for another day because part of the language, you can translate it this way, that God repents of what God planned. Hmm, that's a big topic. What the people have done that have made God become so angry is what I think is recorded in in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, which says, they traded the truth about God for a lie. They gave up truth for a lie. So they worshiped and they created the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So we got idols. Sometimes they're very subtle. Sometimes they weasel their way into our hearts, and sometimes we believe they're innocent, they're not that big a deal, and, and that we can, we can keep them all under control. What happens with the people is Moses says, that's it, you've got to get rid of your idols. Listen to what happens. 
So he comes down to the camp, he sees the calf, he sees all the dancing, and, and, and now Moses is angry. So he calmed God down, but now Moses sees it, and he's angry, right? And he, he throws the stone tablets to the ground so the first copies of the Ten Commandments are destroyed. They're obliterated because of Moses' anger and outrage at the corruption of the people. And then it says that he took the calf that they've made, he burned it, ground it into powder, threw it in water, and made the people drink it. You want an idol? You want something inside of you? Here, drink your idol. I'll let your minds wander through the rest of that process that happens after you consume something, huh? Drink it. Drink your idol. Finally, he turns to Aaron, and he demands to know what happened. And he says, how did these people make you do such a terrible thing upon them? And what does Aaron do? He throws the people under the bus. And he says, well, Moses, you know how evil these people are. It's not me. I couldn't help myself. They're just so bad, right? And Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get so completely out of control that the enemies, the people outside, were watching and were amused at how confused the people of God were. And then Moses said, we need a change. Those of you that believe in God, you come and meet me at the tent, and we will take a stand and show that you're on the Lord's side. So here's the important thing to know about idols, to get them out of our lives. It, it's, it's one thing to get rid of them to the point that they have no place of importance in our lives, right? We can, we can downplay them, we can push them to the sides, we can convince them, we can actually physically get rid of them even. <clears throat> but if that's all we do, they'll come back. They'll grow again. What we learn in this text is this. They have to be replaced. Moses said, it's one thing to get rid of that, that statue, but now it's time to replace it with the truth and take a stand at the tent of meeting to show where God is in your life. As we sweep away our idols, praying for God to give us the strength to, to denigrate them to the position that they should have. At the same time, we pray for God to increase in our lives and for us to focus upon Jesus Christ. Paul gives these final words to Timothy. He says, again I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Doesn't, doesn't serve any purpose. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel but must be kind to everyone, even the people that drive you crazy, even the people you violently disagree with. You need to be able to teach, and you need to be able to be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses. They will escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Our enemies are not the people that don't have faith. Our enemies are not the people who stand in opposition to Christianity. They are the people we are to love, the neighbors we are to care for, the people we are to help. Our enemy is the one who wants to hold them captive the one who takes the form of idols, the one who wants to push God out of people's lives and take that position. Our enemy is the evil one. May we be on guard to watch out for him and not allow him to cause us to be tempted to worship him in an idolatrous form in place of the living and true God. May God give us that conviction, that faith, and that trust in him.
in the precious name of Christ. Amen.